okay. Uh, now uh, we are visit to Robert Walker studio and thank you so much Robert. Pleasure, uh, pleasure. Uh, we have some interview about your work, about your life, about your life. So, tell about your uh, childhood. Yes, yeah, okay. Well, we'll start at the very beginning to quote the sound of music. Um, where am I looking? Am I looking at that one? That, okay. Yes. Um, I was born in, uh, in Yorkshire, in uh, the UK, in 1960. Um, so that makes me 62 years old, my God, so quick. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was born to a very arty family. Uh, my cousins were architects um, and uh, my uncles were architects and designers uh, and artists. Uh, and more importantly for me, my, my grandma Gruby, who was on my uh, mother's side, who came from Halifax, was a fantastic artist. She used to um, draw for me when I was a little boy. I used to sit on her, um, on her knee and I could ask her to draw anything from elephants to crocodiles to um, aeroplanes and she would just be able to draw them really beautifully. And that impressed me from a very early age and I suppose because of the genes, I had an ability to do the same sort of thing as I, as I got older. Um, and as most kids were sort of playing outside or um, riding on bikes and things, I was tending to sit and draw and paint as well. So it started from, you know, when I was pre-teens really. Um, and uh, at school it developed into the art rooms uh, with paintings and um, with drawings uh, on the timetable, but also when other people wanted to play rugby or football, I tended to creep away into the art rooms and, um, and, and do art instead. And most of the teachers realized that that's what I felt comfortable with, so they let me. Um, I had started having my first exhibition when I was 15 years old and uh, I, I did pottery and painting. And in fact, my first sale uh, at the Goosewell Gallery in Menston in West Yorkshire um, was to David Hockney's mum, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. bought a, a piece, a sort of fungal type um, ceramics that I did uh, for David for a present. Uh, I suppose when you're a famous artist and your mum's trying to buy you something, they try and think of something a bit different. So she very gracefully got one of my pieces that were sent off to America because David was in um, New York, I think, at that time. So, and that put that aside because it's quite interesting, the connection later on uh, with him. Uh, and by the time I got to the end of school, I knew I wanted to be an artist. And uh, so I went to uh, Bradford Art College, again, where David had been a student for a year, one year. And then after the year, I uh, applied to Bristol uh, university, uh, our college, um, well, the our college first, to do a three-year course in uh, ceramics and printmaking. Uh, and uh, so I completed that and I got a first-class honours degree with that because I worked like stink the whole time and mm. really appreciated the, everything was so fantastic and new and uh, available, you know, the materials were available. So I loved that. Then I went and did a year as a PGCE uh, university student to, qu to um, qualify as a teacher. Mm -hmm. As a kind of backup in case I ever wanted to be a teacher and paint and draw at the same time. Which is really what I ended up doing. And I, I became a, um, a, an art teacher for a long time. And I loved it because when you're enthusiastic about something, you want to give it that enthusiasm to other people. Mm -hmm. So you want to sort of be a bit missionary-like. You want to spread, you know, with the tambourine. You want to spread the good news about, you know, how wonderful art can be. So yeah. that's what I did. And I really enjoyed it. But the problem with teaching is that it tends to take from you rather than, you know, you're giving a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it stops you from being creative yourself if you're not careful because you're teaching all the time yeah. and uh, you're not doing, you know, the danger is you stop doing mm -hmm. and you start teaching. So I uh, decided eventually that it was important for me to do rather than teach, hence, hence the, the move to Bali. Um, but we'll fast forward to that in a bit. 
uh, eventually I became a head of department in a big, very prestigious school in West Yorkshire. Uh, and it was the school that David Hockney had been to as a boy. So there was always a sort of connection with him as an old boy and with his work around the school. They had a few pieces in the collection which I started to catalogue because nobody really paid much attention mm. to them, although they were really valuable. Yeah. And they were just on the wall for the kids to, you know, spring off and, and uh, spoil if, it wasn't, if they weren't careful. So, um, and eventually, uh, one time David came over, it was over in England, and unbeknown to me, I actually knew his niece through some land that my parents had up in the Dales and a section of it they made into a caravan site. And uh, his niece, uh, Lisa, uh, stayed at the caravan site and I used to go walking my dog with her. And uh, one day I was walking the dog and she said, you know, my uncle's a painter. And I sort of said, oh yeah, you know, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> and um, like a lot of people do. And she said, yeah, he uh, he's from Bradford, but he lives in Los Angeles now. And the more she said, the more I started to make uh -huh. connections that, wait a minute, you know, he's in Los Angeles. And she said, yeah, he's quite famous. Uh -huh. And I said, what's your second name, Lisa? Because I only knew her as Lisa. And she said, uh, Hockney. And I kind of went, what? <laughs> so your uncle is? And she said, yeah, David Hockney. Uh -huh. And I went, oh my God, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. Yeah, yeah. And she said, uh, oh, well, actually, Uncle David's in England at the moment, and um, he's doing an exhibition in Salt's Mill mm -hmm. in, uh, in Yorkshire, near, near where I lived. She said, well, go if you want. You know, I'll get an invitation card, and we'll go. So we, we arranged to meet outside Saltaire, and we went. And we went into the gallery where David was, and you could just see his hat. And um, she's and we're surrounded by TV and mm -hmm. and um, you know people trying to get autographs and, and things. She have, uh, some glasses. Uh, yeah, he had the glass, the round point. glasses and yeah. the hat and the you know bright coloured tie, and you yeah. could see it was him straight away. And uh, Lisa went, Uncle David, and he just turned around and <laughs> they got everybody else. Uh -huh. And he came over, you see, because oh, hello, Lisa, how are you? And he <laughs> talks like that. And uh, I said. Um, uh, you know, hello, and she said, uh, David, this is Uncle David, this is Robert, he's head of blah, 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 blah. And uh, we kind of got talking and we hit it off straight away. It was really mm -hmm. nice. And, you know, and I was really, I was trying not to be too, uh, <laughs> too excited about it. I was trying to be cool and, you know, just chat normally. And eventually we went into another room and sat down and uh, he said, oh, you know, it's really nice to meet you and uh, asked about the school. And then uh, Gregory, who was his, uh, is his curator and sort of right-hand man, had his diary. And David said, oh, you know, you must come over to Los Angeles. Well, I mean, people say stuff like that. And yeah. you just say, oh, yeah, yeah, really. Uh -huh. But Gregory was there and David went, when am I free, Gregory? And Gregory looked, in those days, it was a diary, it wasn't a mobile phone. He went, oh, you're free in uh, April. April the 1st to, you know, April the 25th or something. So David said, oh, put Robert in there and come to Los Angeles. So he like, wow. invited me immediately. Yeah. That's so that's I thought, that's oh my God. So I went amazing. home that night and I thought, I'm going to go and see Hockney, you know, in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. in his house, in his swimming pool. And I, I couldn't believe it. Famous swimming Fam pool. Yeah, the famous <laughs> swimming pool, you yeah. know, with the painting lines and everything. Yeah. So this was 1991 or two, 1992, I think. And uh, so I was really excited about it. About a couple of months, but then it must have been about maybe Mar March, February. So March, April, you know, I was kind of, so I was booking flights and getting organized. And my work, my painting, I was selling then and I was exhibiting all over the place. And I, my patron who I mentioned earlier to you the Duchess of Devonshire, who was the Queen's um, cousin, uh, lived nearby, lived next to me, really. Uh, I used to walk my dog in England across her grounds and down to the river, and much to the chagrin of her security guys, because they were always trying, when people like Prince Charles visited, they had the things in their ear and they were going, 
there's a strange guy, you know, walking in the grounds with a dog, and should we stop him? And then the, the, she'd say, don't worry, it's Robert, you know, it's okay. So I'd be like, ha, 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 ha. So, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd been painting and I'd been selling a lot, but then I went to um, Los Angeles, and the, David's studio and colour, the colour that he used, the colour, he says, oh yeah, the colour. Mm -hmm. The colour is was to hit me, you know, like a absolute sledgehammer in my face because I was so used to y Yorkshire and England and kind of greyness and rain. And mm -hmm. Of course, you go to California and it's blue skies yeah. and swimming pools and heat and everything goes bang, you know, with the colour. And of course, David, that's the reason why David went there um, in the first place. So when I went, I had the same kind of meteoric experience that mm -hmm. he had had by going, my God, look at these colors. And I hadn't seen color like that. I'd been to the south of France because I'm a big Van Gogh fan and a Matisse fan and a Cezanne fan. So I'd seen the color in the south of France, which is only the kind of color that I can compare really with LA. But once you get out of the city of LA and you go up into the hills where he lives, you know, it's pure, pure light and pure color. So we painted together and we worked together and, and I had an absolutely fab time. Mm -hmm. And it was like living in another world, literally, because, you know, the kind, you can imagine the kind of people he knows. So, and his friends became my friends. Yeah. So I met all these incredible people who were sort of like the top notch mm -hmm. in their field. So uh, they were all great, you know, in their own, whether they were actors or singers or artists or mm -hmm. musicians. They were the creme de la creme, you know. Yeah. So I was blown away by it all. And Just some name. Uh, uh, some, some names. Friends, uh, like I met Cher in the supermarket doing my shopping, uh -huh. became friends with her. I had barbecues with uh, Kurt Russell, Goldie Hawn, Russell. Michael, yeah. uh, uh, Ian McKellen. Uh -huh. I had lunch with uh, Michael Jackson. Wow. I got to know Janet Jackson because she was my neighbor in Malibu where I live. Mm -hmm. And she invited me around one day for, for um, coffee, tea actually. She said tea and giggled because she knew I was English. So she automatically thought every English man drinks tea, which is true. <laughs> so, and then the doorbell went, the kind of buzzer went, security buzzer went, and Michael walked through the door. And I remember he came up to me and said, you know, I'm Michael, like he needed to tell me he was Michael Jackson, but he was lovely, he was really sweet, sweet mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. So I met him a few times, uh, Sean Penn, uh, lot, so many people I can't even. Don't, don't you, know. you see Andy Warhol? Uh, I never, no, I never met Warhol because well, I think by ninety, I don't even, I can't remember when Warhol died. But no, I'm never. I know David was a friend of Andy Warhol's, uh -huh. but I never met him. Uh, Tony Bennett, the singer, because he paints as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Madonna, Madonna. Uh, spoke to her on the phone. Never met her, but spoke to her on the phone mm -hmm. uh, a few times. Um, Yves Saint Laurent, the, the fashion designer. Mm -hmm. um, the guy that they, um, what's the guy that, um, Sassoon, Vidal Sassoon, the, hair, ah, the, the yeah. famous hair guy. He rang me, because I took, a, I took a, a fruit cake that my mum had made for David in England. I took it in my suitcase, this big yeah. fruit cake. And I was down at the beach house in Malibu and I got a phone call uh, from uh, the studio, from David's house. And uh, this guy came on uh, the phone and said, um, is that Robert? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's Robert. And he went, oh, Robert, I just want to say your, your, your mom's fruitcake was delicious. And I went, oh, thank you. Who is this? And he went, oh, it's, um, it's Vidal Sassoon. You know? And I thought, oh, my God. So I rang my mum that night and I said, mum, Vidal Sassoon's been eating your fruitcake. And she went, what, who? And I went, Vidal Sassoon, oh my God, Vidal Sassoon's been it. So it was everything like that. It was a crazy time. Yeah. And it, we did crazy things and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. We went to the Grand Canyon. I sat whilst he painted in the Grand Canyon. We went to all the major galleries and museums in Los Angeles. I had a private tour by Hockney around mm -hmm. the, you know, I mean, it was just, and all the time I was sort of, you know, pinching myself. My bedroom had a, David Hockney painted on the wall and he'd even painted the wallpaper and when he sold the house 
a few years later, they had to cut cut the wall out because the wall was worth as much as the house. No. Oh. Because the paint, you know, because the painting was an original. Yeah. So he couldn't sell the painting with the house because he would have made it like two million, you uh -huh. know, just for the painting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it was cr crazy things like that. So I, I, had, I had a wonderful time, and um, I came back to eventually. I came back to England, all fired up. Did these, you know, amazing paintings and things that I was really fired up about. And I, in fact, I got a sabbatical from my work for six months, and I went to Borneo in um, Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, and I painted for six months the jungles in Borneo and then I went back to England and I had a big exhibition in England of all the Borneo paintings and they all saw like that and I was really surprised because I thought you know who's going to buy a painting of a jungle mm -hmm. in England you know who's going to want a painting by but by then I sort of developed this idea of layering colour and mark making and so although they were jungles they weren't purely a representation of jungles they were kind of patterny brightly colored jungles so I suppose people you know people like color people like color everybody likes yeah, color yeah, yeah. they all it makes you feel good so that you know that was terrific and then I came away then I carried on working for a bit but I was in touch with David all the time and then David asked me back again mm -hmm. I think it was the following year said so come over again same kind of time so I did that, and then I stayed again in Los Angeles for a while, working with him, and we were, we traveled to other places and met more people, and it was like somebody put take, picked you up from your normal life and put you in this surreal environment where all these incredible people lived, then picked you up again and put you back, in, you know, and you went, well, was that real? Sometimes you think you're dreaming, you know, because yeah. it was so crazy. Yeah. And then at the same time I was working with a project in uh, England about a Soil Hill Pottery Trust, an old pottery that I was trying to save in, in West Yorkshire. And, and uh, I became friends with um, David Attenborough uh, through that, so David Attenborough, because David is a massive collector of ceramics. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he uh, so I used to meet him at the auctions, because at one time I was a dealer and I was buying ceramics for different people. Then I met, so I met David because of that. <clears throat> and then we kind of became friends, you know, for enough for him to go high, Robert, and for me to go. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I, I had a really good friend called Lucy Ree, Dame Lucy Ree, who was an amazing potter in London. And I, uh, she was a mutual friend, David knew Lucy. So it's how this kind of thing works. You know, one person knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody so you become sort of part of a group yeah. without really realizing you are you know yeah. because of this these amazing connections that you have uh -huh. uh, and like I'll give you an example of that w way before this happened uh, my first partner was called Michelle de Rothschild one of the de Rothschild family that I didn't know of initially when I met him but then later I did and uh, he was a really good friend of Princess Diana and uh, one time he was asking me all these questions. I'd gone down to London to see him. I used to go down most weekends to London, meet him in the National Gallery, spend the weekend, maybe go back up to Yorkshire on the sort of Monday morning or something. And one time he was asking all these questions about when were you born, well, who's your family, you know, what's your full address? And I said, this is a bit weird, you know, why are you asking me all these questions? And he said, mm -hmm. he said, don't, no, don't, he said, don't ask, but he said, it's a good, there's a good reason. Mm -hmm. And he was vetting me for security. I didn't realize it, but he was, the security had to check me out, you mm -hmm. know? And um, we went, and then I came down a few weeks, like a good few weeks later, and he had a little mini, mini clubman uh, no, sorry, Mini Cooper that he used to drive around London mm -hmm. in and um, he picked me up and he said there's somebody at the house who wants to meet you as we were driving back through Westminster and I said, uh, oh, you know, who is it anyway? <laughs> and he wouldn't tell me and I was kind of, you know, I was a bit sort of, no, not worried but a bit apprehensive because normally it was just, you know, the two of us and, so we got back to the house and then um, 
it was Diana and I could tell from the back of her she was sitting looking out the window by Lord's Cricket Ground which he, his, his apartment looked out on and I knew it was her from the back of her head because she had a very distinct haircut and mm. she turned around and said oh Robert Michelle's told me a lot about you uh, and then there was a sort of oh hello and, uh, and then she said right let's go shopping so we went shopping to on Oxford Street yeah for the rest of the day and I met her a few times after that but that was through I'm saying that to show you the connections you know from one the way that one person connects you with another person mm -hmm. connects you with another person would you tell uh, about your keramic collection Yes, yes, yeah, how, yeah. How much money, items, and so on. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I collected, I collected contemporary ceramics first, and I dealt in contemporary ceramics because I used to buy Lucy Rees work and resell it to people that wanted investments and things. So I had a big collection in England of contemporary ceramics, but I sold that when I came to Southeast Asia, uh -huh. and then when I came here, because of the. Um, The, ge the geography of uh, Southeast Asia and the trade routes from from China to um, Java and Sumatra and uh, Malacca, you know, the Straits of Malacca and everything. Golden, I started the Golden Way. Yeah, golden yeah, way, yes. and then the Golden Triangle yeah. and the Silk Routes. Uh -huh. So I, I started to read up about that because you tend to sort of read up about places where you're going to live. Um, and uh, I started to read about the shipwrecks and the, the, how dangerous it was for these old ships to navigate around these different continents. Well, not continents, but different islands and things. Mm -hmm. So consequently, there were a lot of shipwrecks and shipwrecks that were carrying cargo yeah. from the sort of early Yuan, Tang, Song uh, dynasties, Ming dynasties. I got really excited about that because you can actually You know, you can pick something up and hold it, and you know that it's 900 years old. And not only that it's 900 years old, but probably for 895 years, it's mm. been under the ocean, sitting in a coral reef somewhere, which I was just blown away by. Mm -hmm. So I started collecting a lot, and you've seen already, and you can show yeah, yeah. in the house, you know, crazy. It's Beautiful. a collector that, well, this is one here. Mm -hmm. As a collection, you get, you know, collectors famously get, um, carried away by their collections and they get really excited by it and that's what I did really and for, luckily I know a lot of um, dealers in Java who can get me things you know really interesting things from the divers mm -hmm. so you know they come up and then I get them so they're they're they're, they're not through lots of different agents mm -hmm. they're from the, the ocean basically mm -hmm. through one hand to me so that's amazing so I, you know so that's how that started yeah. was the um, you know with the with the collecting of that that's amazing yes it's a... and and it, you know you never even see things like that in England uh -huh. you know you don't even go into shops that have it you know you where would you buy a Ming Dynasty bowl you know I wouldn't know you know I wouldn't even know how to get them whereas here they kind of throw them at you you know they were like <laughs> not literally they don't throw them But, you know, they can say this is a Ming Dynasty 1610 Ming bowl, and I, I just think, oh my god, you know. So that's been my another passion whilst I've been here. I tend to get, as I suppose, as an individual, I tend to get focused on things and I give it my all. You know, once I get into something, I just can't stop, whether it's eating a bar of chocolate or painting a painting mm -hmm. or collecting I kind of like get a real bug about it mm -hmm. which is good really you know if it doesn't go stupid so that's and that's how I paint I paint um, I paint in in uh, batches uh, I paint all of a sudden I go berserk and then I get really exhausted and tired and then I stop for a bit and then it, I can feel it you know welling up inside me again uh -huh. And then I go again, you know, it's like those little wine, you know, the cars, the little cars that you go zoom, 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 zoom. Yeah. Then you put them down and then they go yeah. and then eventually they, they, they lose their momentum uh -huh. and then they stop. And then you have to pick them up again and go boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> then you put, it's like that, you know, yeah, that's yeah. What the kind of like I am. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so, and, and I'm just really in, just started the um, series of these uh, paintings. 
about a week ago and I'm back in the that mood now you know the kind of and 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 also it's worth saying because Bali has a rainy season from kind of about October through to spring or oh, spring but February March mm -hmm. six months um, it prevents me from doing a lot of painting in that time because the weather and the humidity stops the paint from drying so once the once the sun comes like it is now and the rainy season stops you get this sudden uh, impetus of painting because all the all the, cl the climate is right so everything is right mm -hmm. at this time of the year now through you know through to after Christmas January February I'll be painting a lot because it's right it's the right time to right. paint you know for this for the actual country as well for the seasons well it's not real well the, it is a season because it's a rainy season or a dry season and now we're in the dry season so it's perfect you know so um, yeah so that's you know kind of where I am really I came to Bali about eight years ago before that I was in Malaysia for about five years I left England quite despondent really with England with the weather and the politics and the I just had enough of it really mm -hmm. so I fled in a way from England to Malaysia and when I landed when I touched down I remember going first of all to Borneo as I said on this sabbatical for painting and I um, I just couldn't, you know, I landed and I just couldn't believe it. The smell, the sights, mm -hmm. the, the, the heat, you know, the, the colour, the flowers, the plants, the scale of everything. You know, in a jungle, I'm a Western artist, so I'm used to perspective. You know, as yeah. things go away, they get smaller. As things come forward, they get bigger. That's, that's how it works. But the West is the only area that uses that technology, that idea. China, the Chinese and the and Southeast Asians, they don't use perspective. Mm -hmm. They and, and in the early days, Byzantine art and early Renaissance art, they didn't use perspective. It's a relatively new thing. And it used to be if you were important in a picture, you'd be big. And if you weren't very important, you'd be small. Mm -hmm. And that was Byzantine art. And in China, you know, it's, it's, a, it's uh, again, it's about the positioning of the figures and obviously sometimes there's reverse perspective so it's about giving you as much information as possible in the picture not everything having to be by vanishing point and um, her, you know horizon and then the vanishing point then all these lines going to it. it's a very western thing so I've kind of broken away from that again I'm not mm -hmm. interested in that I'm more interested in the mark making and the Im and the composition for its own sake mm -hmm. rather than for uh, a mathematical theory you know of making a, p a painting in perspective and that's what amazed me with the jungle in the jungle you can get little leaves in the foreground and whopping great big leaves that people yeah. shelter under when it yeah. rains in the background so the big and small doesn't mean anything yeah. so all you see is this kind of big like a textile woven pattern mm -hmm. of leaves and structure and raindrops and little animals and so that made me that blew me away you know that made me think that's, wow that's fantastic yeah, that's broken so, broken break, yeah break, you break it's just tsh, yeah you yeah. don't need that yeah, yeah, yeah. so that was really exciting so you know the 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 um the actual way of living here the life the pace of life the heat as you get older you know you it's good to have heat because everything starts to wake a bit and um so that uh, you know the people are beautiful I, I paint the people a lot and uh, old ladies you've seen my old lady you know I love old ladies just the wrinkles and the, yeah. everything about them I love you know And the, but people are just really really beautiful mm -hmm. you don't get that in England or if you do they know they're beautiful and then they become you know not very nice people so here suits me really well and uh, you know this is where I plan to stay really and, uh, and my, my work is themed around my interests you know the big paintings are about my collecting about my fish in the pond um, about the flowers and trees around me and the temples and the landscape and I go for a walk every morning I'm, I'm always on the beach by sunrise you know and as the sun comes up and the light comes out and you hear the waves and you know it couldn't be better everything is just perfect here I wish mm -hmm. I'd done it you know 10 years earlier but 
you know, sometimes you can't. When you want to do things, you can't. And it's usually to do with finances and things, but now I'm lucky I can. So I, you know, I, so I went for it, really. Um, so that's kind of my story, really.